Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Later in the show, we'll bring you a jubilee in celebration of bad boy artist Egon Schiele and celebrate the groundbreaking films of director Spike Lee. But we begin today's show with a special focus on Iraq. Fifteen years ago, the might of the U.S. military rolled into Baghdad, and without any warning, the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq had begun. We'll be talking to an art critic to discuss what that invasion and subsequent war meant for arts and culture in Iraq. And on that same theme... We'll also tell you why this Iraqi film is marking the end of an era in the country that lasted nearly three decades. And art imitates life. We'll bring you five distinct pieces of artworks drawn from the invasion of Iraq. Fifteen years ago, on the 20th of March 2003, without any warning or official declaration of war, the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq began. Under the code named Operation Iraqi Freedom, tanks and troops rolled into Baghdad. Followed by a campaign of aerial bombardment named Shock and Awe by the invading forces, it was intended as a show of brute force. The effects of the ensuing war were wide-reaching and is still felt to this day. Beyond the devastating death toll and beyond the mass destruction of Baghdad, the invasion also left its mark in more subtle ways, affecting the arts, the creative class and cultural life across Iraq. Joining me now from Amsterdam is art critic Nat Muller. She is also a curator for Middle Eastern Contemporary Art and joins us to talk about the diaspora of Iraqi artists following the U.S. invasion. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nat. Now, how Pleasure. has the U.S. invasion uh, changed the work of Iraqi artists in the diaspora? Well, I think each era will produce its own aesthetics, but for Iraqi artists in the diaspora, and they share this with Palestinian artists, many of them are actually relating to a place of belonging that does not exist anymore. So uh, it's very important for them to also talk about that history, that narrative, an Iraq of their childhood that doesn't exist anymore. This happens, for example, in the work of Sadiq Kwash al-Fraji, where he tries to depict a place of innocence um, that has been completely destroyed. But other artists have tried to look at, for example, the Saddam era through a more humoristic lens. And here examples are Adel Abedin, Mahmoud Obeidi. So that's another way of looking at experiences and trying to also make artists and audiences internationally relate to an Iraq that we know through carnage and conflict and media images mm -hmm. in a different way. So th that would be really important to um, try to put a different narrative or a different imagery that we are used to other than the media images. Yes. Nat, tell me about some artworks, some specific artworks that really depicted the conflict in Iraq. So uh, an example I always like to use is that of artist Wafa Bilal. He has been living in the United States for quite a while. And in 2004, just after the Iraqi invasion, uh, the American invasion of Iraq, his brother Haji was killed by a drone. So he has a very personal, and very painful relationship to the Iraqi invasion. Um, and uh, he did in 2007 a quite interesting project called Domestic Tension, where he closed himself in a gallery space for a month. And through a website, viewers could access that space where he was staying and they could shoot at him and then paintballs, paintballs would be fired. So he was actually on the one hand trying to show that this is an Iraqi body where an international audience can shoot at and look at how this embodied warfare has become through drone technology. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a real body that you're shooting at. And what was quite interesting in that project is that because this was all happening online, you would get people trying on the one hand to really shoot at him and others trying to save him by trying to pull the paintball gun, for example, to the right. So it also really divided the audience in a certain sense. And um, this is what we call 
a uh, embodied performance and a performance of endurance because this was a month. And it also showed how easy it was to shoot at an Iraqi body. Yes. But it's a very, very um, interesting one. It way. sounds Another very intense. That so another project he did um, in a few days later was a performance where he had on his back tattooed the map of Iraq with the cities in Arabic script. Yes. And for each um, 5,000 American soldiers killed, a red dot would be tattooed on his back. For each 10,000 Iraqi people killed, uh, an invisible ink would be t tattooed on his back. So you would only see the Iraqi casualties under a UV light. Yes. Again, trying to show that there is a difference um, in how we perceive American deaths and how we perceive Iraqi deaths and trying to really highlight the tension between those invisibilities by, again, literally having it tattooed and mm -hmm. marked on his body. All right, Nat, last but not least, real quick, can you name me some artists that use their work as a form of, uh, as a form of protest against the U.S. invasion? I think for me, the best example here is Michael Rakowitz, who is uh, an American artist but has Iraqi Jewish roots. And he did a fantastic project that actually stems from the American invasion from Iraq, where he looks at the museum looting of the National uh, Museum in Iraq, where so many precious artifacts disappears, uh, disappeared. And he's trying to actually recreate those fantastic artifacts through um, using throwaway materials, like packaging material. And it's a way of showing, on the one hand, the heritage of Iraq and that, you know, this is a culture that has been existing for many thousands of years and has a wealth of diversity and is a treasure for the world, mm -hmm. but is so much at risk of being destroyed. Unfortunately. Uh, and by, unfortunately, and, and obviously this has continued in the aftermath and this has continued with ISIS as well. So this is an ongoing project and um, it really shows very beautifully uh, how, uh, what, on the one hand, what is the ephemerality of cultural artifacts, um, how fragile they are, and how important it is to remember them uh, and, and to share them with the world. All right, Nat, thank you so much for giving us that great insight. It was a pleasure having you on our show today. Tony Blair grinning for a selfie in front of an explosion. Bush's portrait surrounded by pairs of shoes, a ring of U.S. soldiers standing guard over a fenced-in territory. Showcase has chosen five pieces of art we think exemplify the invasion of Iraq. Because even though art could not stop the war in Iraq, it's certainly influencing how it's remembered. Fear. Bloodshed. Invasion. Fifteen years have passed since the US-led invasion of Iraq, but the influence still lingers in politics, in society, and in the culture and art world. A ring of US soldiers stand guard over a fenced-in territory, a monument so unstable that it's held together by brown packing tape. The structure threatens to collapse as it sags under its own weight. If the monument disappears, what shall remain behind? This is the question centering around this artwork and arguably the invasion of Iraq for artist Thomas Hishon. It's a starting point of anger and frustration at policy that's, you know, at beyond our control as citizens. To many people who made this piece a viral hit, this grotesquely comic artwork says it all. Only former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair would think that's a good photo opportunity. These paintings display chaos, fragments of lives dismantled by troops, gunfire and bloodshed. Yet Esam Pasha paints through feverish strokes of every happy color imaginable. That's because the young Iraqi artist conforms to hope as the most striking form of protest. Every time Iraq uh, rises from the ashes just like the phoenix, and I think that's a very uh, 
optimist uh, idea and inspires the optimist name. This was one of the most symbolic moments of the US-led invasion of Iraq. And this became an iconic artwork stemming from the invasion itself. A dark sculpture placing former US President George W. Bush's shoes around his portrait with an ironic caption. Bush ducked in the moment, avoiding being hit by either of the shoes, but farewell kissed by Mahmoud Abadi seems to have hit the spot. This colossal work by eminent Iraqi artist conveys suffering and confusion whilst acting as a manifesto of sorts, a reaction against and commentary upon the US invasion of Iraq. We got a war after war, the sanction, destruction, and this is the implication of all these. It definitely put me in a position which I have to create work. It's not to document, but more than to uh, give a voice of, of, uh, of a protest against the destruction of my country. Ever since the Gulf War in Iraq, not a single domestically produced film has appeared in any of the country's cinemas. But now director Mohammed al Daraji is poised to change all that. <laughs> The Journey is an international co-production loosely based on a true story. It follows a would-be suicide bomber who's about to blow herself up in Baghdad's only train station on the same day former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein was hung. The psychological thriller, which has screened at many international film festivals, reflects a recent resurgence of Iraqi cinema both at home and abroad. To talk more about the journey, I'm joined from Baghdad by the director himself, Mohammed Al Daraji. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mohammed. Now, I know you faced a lot of uh, trouble making your film, your first feature film, um, Ahlam. What was the filmmaking process like with the journey? Well, the journey is quite uh, uh, difficult than uh, Ahlam. Ahlam, we made it in 2003 and 4. The journey, we shot it in 2016. It's about uh, 12 to 13 years. Uh, the situation in Baghdad uh, uh, on the time in Ahlam was complicated. But with the journey was also complicated uh, because uh, on the time when we were uh, shooting the film, we had uh, Daesh, ISIS, was around the border of uh, Baghdad on the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very tense. It was uh, not uh, easy uh, to shoot a, a future film. But thanks to the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army, uh, they were very supportive and very helpful uh, to give us the right security. We had some foreigner crew and foreign, uh, foreigner cast with us, uh, but we managed to shoot it within a period of time, uh, around three months. Um, but it was not, uh, uh, it was a tough job to do it. Yes. Okay, so the journey has been described as a movie that touches on social security issues. Um, What's your thoughts on raising awareness through cinema? Uh, this is a very important subject in Iraq today. We are asking the question, uh, me as Mohammed, uh, I try to ask the question is, what if the suicide bomber or the extremism or the terrorism, what if we bring them back to their humanity? What will happen if we manage to talk with them? Because imagine, uh, 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 when, when a suicide bomber comes to Istanbul or Ankara or in Baghdad or in Moscow or in Paris, you know, he came to the market or to the street and then he pumped the street. He killed people. He don't know these people. He never met them before. He never have any issue with these people as a, as a normal human being, level to level, you know. The, he don't have any court case, nothing with them, not love story, nothing. So the question that I have is what if before this uh, suicide bomber bombed the, the, the place where he is. What if we talk with him? What if he, uh, we, he spent time with us? What if he discovered our humanity? What if we managed to, to bring back his humanity that has been lost? It? What, this is what the film about. The film about it. This, this young girl, she's coming to the train station on the day of Eid uh, uh, in 2006. And at the train station where thousands of people uh, uh, gathering at the train station on the 30th of December, you know, uh, she tried to push the trigger of the bomb. 
I stop it. Yes. And I took her for a journey to meet those people. That's we need it in Iraq today because since since September 11, 2001, and since all these titles of a war against terrorism, war against Islam, terrorism, you know, again uh, extremism in Islam, all these titles has been not help us at all. Yeah. We create more terrorism, we create more extremism, we create more Political and different turmoil. names of cells and and then and we, we, we did not we did not manage to, to put it down. So my question is can we talk? Can we speak? Mm -hmm. Can we talk human to human? Yeah. That's the important, and I think we do need it in Iraq after, after we get ready from Daesh, after we have the victory mm -hmm. in Iraq from Daesh. Now, for the society, we need to talk about this kind of subject because it's important for we Iraq We do today. indeed. Mohammed, I want to talk about the time that you were arrested by um, you, the U.S. Army. Now, what circumstances were you put in, and did that have an effect on how you portrayed them in this movie? Well, <laughs> that's that's very very smart and very uh, and very important question. And not a lot of people ask me that question. Um, I think the experience that I had it in 2004, on the 17th of December, where I when I was kidnapped by Al Qaeda and then kidnapped by the militia, and then after that I was arrested by the uh, American, put in the prison for seven days. Me and my crew member. I took this experience and I used it in the journey. First of all, I took the experience when the gun was put in my head uh, uh, by Al-Qaeda and they were about to shoot us and throw us on the Tigris River. I took this moment where I was collapsed and the image that before I died has come to me. I use this image on this, on this girl as, a, as the moment she's about to kill herself. She closed her eyes and she took go for the journey that I portrayed in the film. But yes. on the same time, I portrayed the American soldiers because during my prison uh, uh, in the green zone at the American army on the time in 2004, I met, the, I, met, I met the American soldiers. They were very tough, harsh, you know, there is no humanity at all. But as soon as they take the uniform out, you see there is humanity with them. You see there is the soldiers, that they have a wife, that they have a child. You see different soldiers. So this kind of, this kind of complicated situation that the, the American soldiers, they had, I portrayed it on the film. On the mm -hmm. film, there is a scene, they are very tough, harsh against the Iraqi, but at the same time, he's singing a song for his girl when he's, when he's in the phone. So he shout to the Iraqi uh, baby, you know, to shut up the baby, but on the same time, he's on the phone uh, speaking with his yep. baby and, and singing for his baby. Yes. This kind of thing I portrayed it on the film, and this is what I experienced by myself. So yes. that was a very smart question you had. Yes, Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, we have to end it there, but it was a pleasure having you on our show today. Still to come on Showcase, seeing the casualties of war with a cinematic eye. In Syriated, a look at the heart of the Syrian war through the eyes of those caught in the conflict. <laughs> Still doing the right thing. And we say happy birthday to an iconic director. But first, here's a look at a few other stories that caught our eye. The 17th edition of the International Animation Film Festival of Meknes is underway. And this year, there's a special focus on women working behind the scenes. This year's guest of honor is Disney and Pixar alum, Brenda Chapman. During her keynote speech, the award-winning animator encouraged female filmmakers to follow their dreams, even if it means working outside the studio system. Star Wars The Last Jedi was the big winner at this weekend's Empire Awards in London, scooping five awards and the TV and film magazine's Icon Award for star Mark Hamill Star Wars Films. The Last Jedi won Best Film, Best Director, Best Actress, Best Visual Effects and Best Costume. Hamill said he believes the appeal of the series is that it's a fairy tale disguised as sci-fi or fantasy.
Fans are buzzing over the release of a new song by two of Broadway's hottest stars, Hamilton creator Lin-Manuel Miranda and Ben Platt, the original star of Dear Evan Hansen, have recorded a duet called Found Tonight. It's a lyrical combination of two songs from each musical. The Tony Award-winning artist recorded it in support of the upcoming March for Our Lives demonstration planned after the high school massacre in Parkland, Florida. It's been seven years since war broke out in Syria, and from the beginning, filmmakers have responded by turning their cameras on the conflict in multiple different ways. Belgian director Philip Van Leeu was one of them. His latest film, Inseriated, is an intense, raw drama that illustrates the effects of war on ordinary people who have to live through it. Wartime Syria. Every day is just a struggle to survive until tomorrow for this Damascus family trapped in their homes. Inseriated is a tense thriller that won an audience award at the Berlinale last year. And now the film has opened in cinemas across Lebanon, where its cast and crew showed up to promote it for a Beirut audience. In the script, these characters are in this place, under the circumstances happening outside. It talks about how this war moved inside the houses, inside themselves as characters, and how they're coping with it and spending their days. These people were forced to be in such circumstances. This is a very important point, and this is why this film is not only about Syrian people. No, it speaks about people who can be anywhere in the world living in the same suffering. And for the audience, the film is a way to understand what Syrians are going through. <laughs> From the moment I walked into the theater, I felt like I walked inside of the house of this family. And every time I heard the sound of shelling, I was afraid like them. It was very emotional, and all the actors are really great. It's very important to have it screened in Lebanon so that we know what's happening in Syria. Maybe we can relate more with the people who fled the war to come to Lebanon. We're getting to know why they fled. It's scary. It puts in the trauma. It takes you slowly through the suffering. But war isn't just the only trauma this family faces. Inseriated may be difficult to watch, but as critics have described it, it's gripping from start to finish. That's it on Showcase for today. Head to our YouTube channel for more of our coverage from the global art scene. But before we go, let's take a look at a director who helped start a revolution in terms of how African-American stories were told on the big screen. Spike Lee broke down stereotypes and gave to new, fresh voices in films from the hip-hop-themed Do the Right Thing to the dramatic biopic Malcolm X. He turns 61 today. I'm Efton Hun. Thanks for watching Showcase. Bye for now. Mother, sister. Now, Mookie, don't work too hard today. The man says it's gonna be hot as the devil. And you sorry about teasing me about being left back three times, about being on welfare, about me and my brothers having three different fathers? I suggest you look outside that window. You've been laying down and bowing down for 400 years. You're not an American. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. That's right, you get snubbed. The next move is freaks, it always has been. Question is, is he ready and willing to do what needs to be done?